Hi everybody, welcome back to another video. I'm Mark, the Diabetes Diet Guy, talking all things diabetes, helping you get on top of those tricky glucose levels and helping you live healthier lives. Now today we're looking at whether high protein diets can help with fat loss. Whether or not this is going to be something we should be looking at in more detail, or is it just another dietary gimmick? Let's get into it. So the study we're going to be looking at was kindly sent to me by one of my consultants and it was published in 2014. I'll link to it below in the description box and it's looking at several different studies and the mechanisms as to why protein might be the key macronutrient in managing people's body weight. Now high protein diets have been quite mainstream for some time but in recent years they're getting a lot more attention and probably been in the media much more but you'll know them from various different names. Examples include the keto diet, South Beach diet, Atkins diet, and there's lots more, each of which will play around with the protein and fat composition somewhat, um, but they generally all have one thing in common is that, that they tend to control the amount of carbohydrates that someone eats, much below normal dietary recommendations. Now, one thing that we do know without even jumping into the study, just as general nutritionists, is that protein is the most satiating macronutrient. So when we're saying macronutrient, we mean big nutrient. So carbohydrates, fat, and protein. Alcohol is also in there, but we don't tend to talk about that one too much when we're talking about our actual diets. And satiating means the one that fills you up the most. So protein is king of the macronutrients. It makes us feel fuller for longer, followed by carbohydrates. And in last place, contrary to common belief, is fat. One of the ways that we can measure this is using a VAS or VAS scale, which is a visual analog scale. Essentially, it asks people questions about how they feel after eating different meals. And when we play around with the protein content um, in terms of how much protein is in that meal, we can then see how full people feel after, the, after eating it. But this is where the plot thickens, because not all proteins are created equal. Certain proteins seem to have a more satiating effect than others because we get proteins from lots of different sources, whether it's animal sources and plant-based sources, each of which has a different combinations of things called amino acids, which are basically the building blocks of protein. So if you think of a protein as a house, the amino acids are the bricks that make up that house, of which we have two types. We have indispensable amino acids, which basically means your body can't make those. So the only way you can get those is by eating them. And we have dispensable amino acids, which your body can manufacture from different substrates. So typically the best sources of protein in our diet are the ones that provide all the indispensable amino acids, which typically comes from animal sources, but isn't limited to some plant-based sources such as beans, pulses, lentils, and legumes. Now the next step in this is then looking at the quality of the protein. So we can apply a digestible indispensable amino acid score or a D-I-A-A-S. And this basically looks at how much of that protein is absorbed and the quality of the nutrition that we're getting from it essentially. And what we find is that those protein sources with the best score tend to be the most satiating. And on top of that, we find that the most satiating proteins tend to be from animal sources as opposed to the ones from plant-based sources. However, that doesn't mean there isn't a place for plant-based protein sources. It just means the most satiety inducing, the ones that make you feel fuller for longer, tend to be the higher quality proteins, which in fairness, do come from animal-based products. So we do know that protein will keep you fuller for longer. And obviously if you're feeling fuller for longer, you have less chance of eating and therefore you have more chance of losing weight and inducing some fat loss. So that is the first reason high protein diets might be one crucial element to losing weight. The second thing that the study looked at was the dietary induced thermogenesis of eating. So what the hell is that? Dietary induced thermogenesis basically looks at how many calories it takes to digest food. So when you eat, you actually expend energy digesting and absorbing nutrients. And you guessed it, protein has the highest dietary induced thermogenesis score. In other words, you use more calories when you're eating protein. Of course, when you've eaten something, you're always going to be in a, neg a positive energy balance. So you're going to take on more calories than what you expended digesting it. But obviously, if you can make the most of the food that you're eating, i.e. burn up more calories whilst you're digesting it, maybe that's a tool that we can use in order to help you lose weight because every little counts. 
So for every 10 percentage points that protein makes up a mil, you get around an additional 29 kilojoules for our friends um, that use kilojoules, I think in America and Australia. In the UK, we use kilocalories, which is a much smaller number. Essentially, we divide it by around 4.2, and that gives you your figure. So we're talking very small numbers, you know, sort of around seven calories. But obviously, the higher the protein intake in this respect, the, uh, the more calories you'll burn digesting that. But we're still talking very small numbers. So actually, in terms of the dietary induced thermogenesis, it may increase the amount of calories you're expending. Whether or not it's a difference between fat loss and no fat loss is another question. Which leads us on to number three. And this is probably the most significant one here. And this is looking at the satiety inducing hormonal response that is triggered when you eat higher protein amounts. Quick physiology lesson. When we eat food, we produce hormones. Hormones to digest the food, hormones to break down the food, and hormones to signal the brain when to stop eating. And we have lots of those latter hormones, the satiety inducing hormones. So basically hormones to tell you that you're done, you don't need to eat anymore. Hormones that also trigger other hormones. So for example, one hormone that is released when you eat food triggers more insulin to be produced and insulin basically helps nutrients get to where it needs to go into the cells to be used for energy. So it's a very complex process when you eat a meal, things you don't even know that's happening. Two of these hormones called GIP and GLP-1 are basically hormones that you release after eating that help to slow down the absorption of food and signal to your brain that you are feeling full. In fact, it's these hormones that are currently being manipulated in the medication category for type 2 diabetes, the GLP-1 agonists. You take a daily or once weekly injection and it helps you to feel full up and helps to reduce your blood sugars. Um, and the latest one, which I did a recent blog on uh, called Terzepatide, is showing an average weight loss when people take this medication of around 22% of overall body weight. And that's huge, considering most diets only achieve around 3%. Watch this space for that. I'll link to the video at the end of this video. Another one of these hormones is called cholecystokinane, so CKK. And what this hormone does is it stimulates motor intestinal activity and significantly contributes to the inhibition of gastric emptying. In other words, it slows down the transit of food so it keeps you feeling fuller for longer. So why are we talking about all these hormones? Protein appears to be the nutrient that produces the largest rise in these hormones when you eat. So this is significant. The hormones that make you feel full are stimulated the most when you have higher protein meals. So are there any downsides? Of course, when they're ups, there's always downs and I wouldn't be a dietitian if I didn't look at both sides. Now the study looks at a lot of big words and a lot of processes such as the TCA cycle, metabolomics, and branch chain amino acid degradation. Now I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but the take home here is that due to mitochondrial stress, which are kind of like the powerhouses of the cells that help you produce energy, these mitochondria can become stressed with high protein diets, which may contribute to metabolic disease. This is particularly evident when protein or high protein is eaten with high fat, which if you are relying on a lot of those animal based products can be the case for some individuals, particularly if you're in a hyper energetic state, i.e. you're eating more than you're burning off. Another issue identified, which is a Topic of controversy is the higher load placed on the kidneys to filter the additional protein metabolites, the breakdown products from the protein, for the kidneys to deal with, which in theory can cause some stress to them. There's not a huge amount of evidence for this, but the study does mention it, so I will mention it as well. Now for most people, this is probably gonna be absolutely fine, particularly if you have healthy kidneys. Whether or not this goes on to cause long-term damage is not established. There's not many studies looking at it. So it's a topic of debate that continues to go on. Where it is significant is if anyone has impaired kidney function or chronic kidney disease, in which case it's best to speak to your doctor or dietitian before embarking on a high protein diet, because in these instances, that increased renal load can cause problems. Another thing to think about is the overall dietary quality. Just increasing the protein is unlikely to just lead to weight loss automatically particularly if you're relying on those animal-based sources. Some can be quite low fat, quite low calorie, such as chicken breast, turkey breast, low fat um, mints, for example, egg whites. But actually, because our population is around two thirds overweight or obese, we know that most people aren't relying on those lower fat products, 
lower calorie products. In fact, actually with a high protein intake, often the fat and the calories follow it. And so they end up in a hyper energetic state. So basically taking on more calories than they're expending and they gain weight. So actually almost talking about this is the very thing that leads to people gaining too much weight. But of course it's multifactorial, um, lots of things feeding into this and that's just one of them. So what's my view? So the paper's very interesting and it's something that I've come across a couple of times in the past. I don't think this is necessarily a key to weight loss. I think actually you need to look at the diet and the lifestyle in a much more holistic style. So we're looking at all different parts of it. It could be a good way for some people to help them lose weight. We do know that protein has the most um, satiety inducing effect, fills you up for longer. Interesting about the hormones and the upregulation of those that also help you feel fuller for longer. And also the dietary induced thermogenesis, although it's unlikely to make the difference, as I said before, every little counts. But I wouldn't want this to be at the expense of eating high fiber nutritious foods, which this study only briefly mentions. What I wouldn't want to do is for someone to watch this video and their take home be that they should just increase their protein intake at the expense of other nutrients in the diet, particularly those fibrous foods, such as fruit and vegetables, um, and whole grain, whole meal, starchy carbohydrates, because there's so much evidence to show that these have a benefit in terms of our metabolic health and actually help to people to lose weight. So we really need to look at the diet as a whole rather than just honing in on one nutrient at a time. And I think I'll leave it there, guys. So thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you found it useful. If you want more information or an extra helping hand, head over to diabetesdietguide.com. We've got free information for you looking at diabetes um, and just general healthy living. And for those people that need support, we also offer consultancy services, which can give you that extra helping hand to get to where you want to go with your goals. Um, if you did find the video useful, please hit the subscribe and like button. It really helps us out, gets us up that YouTube algorithm and ultimately allows us to help more people. So we'll leave it there and I'll see you later.